Hello. Welcome to the next in our series of videos on demystifying IFRS 9's impairment requirements. I'm Sandra Thompson. I lead our Global Accounting Technical Group for Financial Instruments. And I'm pleased to be here today again with Mark Randall. Mark's in our UK technical group and is very much helping our UK banking clients as they implement IFRS 9. Today we're going to talk about modifications of loans, whether terms of a loan are renegotiated. Now, much of the accounting requirements related to modifications have not changed from those we have today in IS39, but there is an interaction with the new impairment model that means many banks are looking again at what they do. So I will start by explaining how the impairment and modification requirements in IFRS 9 work together. And it's best to do this with an example. Let's assume a bank originates a loan. When it originates that loan, it's in stage one of the impairment model and a 12-month ECL is booked. Then assume some time later that loan has a significant increase in credit risk and therefore moves into stage two with a lifetime ECL booked. And then finally assume some time after that that the bank renegotiates the loan with its customer and amends the terms. For example, it might forgive some of the interest or principal, it might defer some payments, or there might be a more fundamental restructuring of the terms. Now, when the bank does that in a renegotiation, the first thing it needs to do for accounting purposes is to say whether the terms are now so significantly different that this is seen as a new loan for accounting purposes. Essentially, the old loan has expired and a new loan has started. Or alternatively, whether the terms are not so significantly different, so it's seen as a continuation of the same loan. Let's start with the second case. If the loan is seen as a continuation of the same loan, then that applies for impairment purposes too. The loan was in stage two, and it will almost certainly continue to stay in stage two, and a lifetime ECL will continue to be booked. If we then flip back to the first case, if the loan is so significantly changed it's seen as a new loan, then that too applies also for impairment purposes. In this case, you have a new loan, so the loan goes into stage one, and it's likely that a 12-month ECL will be booked. Now, as you can see, the difference between those two could be quite significant. And IFRS 9, like IS39, doesn't give any detailed guidance on how to make that judgment as to whether it is or is not a new loan. So that's the theory. Mark, when it comes to practically applying this, what would you be advice would you be giving our clients? Sure. I think, Sandra, that the key thing is you talked about the accounting. How does that get represented in the systems and the operational kind of platform of the bank? So the real risk for banks when they're doing their IFRS 9 impairment is that whereas from an accounting perspective, it may have been concluded that, that modification was not substantial, so the loan has carried on, it's not a new loan. You should, and therefore, you should still look back to its very first origination date when you're assessing whether or not there's been a significant increase in credit risk. The risk is, from an operational perspective, that that modification might mean that the loan has got a new reference number, has been rebooked in the systems, and that therefore, when the modelers are picking up the origination credit risk for doing the modeling of the significant increase, they actually think that's a new loan. They look at that more recent date when that modification occurred. And for that reason, they might be getting the staging wrong. It might look like it's a stage one, whereas actually, technically, it needs to be looked at by reference to the original date and might be in stage two. And clearly, the opposite might occur as well. So it's really important that there's a link up between the systems piece and the accounting. So in terms of what that means for banks are implementing this, I think there's three key steps I would urge them to take. The first is really to look at your existing accounting de-recognition policy. As you said, Sandra, the rules don't fundamentally change from IS39 into IFRS 9. But what I'm seeing banks identifying in practice is there might have been some sort of life cycle events to products where under IS39 there wasn't really much of an impact where you concluded it was or wasn't a de-recognition, whereas as you've explained in IFRS 9, because of the impairment rules and interaction, that can have a real impact. So it's important, I think, to fill in some of those gaps, but judgments typically can be required because there's really no guidance in the standards around this area of modification of loan assets. So that's step one. The second step is then really to look into the systems and the operational way those loans are booked and understand how the, again, how those life cycle events are captured in there. Is a loan rebooked? Does it get a new reference number or does it just carry on uh, to really understand that? 
And then the third step is to look at, are there any differences between those two worlds, the accounting world and the systems and operations world? And if there are, you need to understand well, what impact might they have. Do they mean there's a real risk of the model that's picking up the wrong data at the wrong reference point? Or perhaps, yes, there's some differences, but they're for a very small uh, collection of instruments. Those changes happen very rarely, and actually, in the grand scheme of things, you can live with those differences. So those are three steps, understand the accounting, understand the systems, and assess the impacts, and where you need to do something off the back of that. So that was all very much focusing on the impairment piece. I think what's important not to forget is also from a measurement piece, IFRS 9 has got new, really very explicit guidance in it saying that if you've got a modification to a financial asset uh, and it doesn't result in derecognition, then you need to think about whether or not there's a so-called modification, gain or loss. And the way the standard tells you to do that is to take your new renegotiated cash flows, discount them back using your original effective interest rate. And if that gives you a higher carrying value than what you've got today, then that's a gain. It gives you, if it gives you a lower carrying value, then that's a loss. And from a practical perspective, when I speak to banks, that's really challenging, first of all, to identify which loans have had modifications in the first place. And secondly, to calculate what that rediscounting gain or loss is. The systems infrastructure aren't geared up to do that currently, so for some of them that could be a big change. Thanks very much, Mark. There's some really good practical advice in there, I think. So just to recap, loan modifications, the rules haven't really changed under IFRS 9, but as we've highlighted, because of the interaction with impairment, this is something that banks are looking at again. We've all you heard how the model works, and Mark's given some really good practical tips about not only looking at the accounting in your existing accounting policy, but also how that ties in with the systems and the fact that you might not be able to track these very easily in the systems, the need to calculate modification gain or loss, and then to assess if the impact's going to be material. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you'll join us next time, and if you'd like to subscribe for the whole series, please click on the button at the bottom of your screen. Bye-bye. Thank you.